This time on Fifth Gear. Vicky and I are off on a day trip to France in two of the most powerful Grand Tourers on the market. The Ferrari 812 Superfast and the Aston Martin DBS Superleggera. I am loving it so far. Which is the luxury car of choice for our cross-channel jaunt? And can either car justify the quarter of a million pound price tag? Man, I love this car! If they're a bit beyond your budget, then Vicky has some second-hand alternative luxury GTs that will still give you a thrill on the road, but won't cost you much more than a new family saloon. It looks good, and therefore you will look good. Johnny battles his way through the crowds at the Frankfurt Motor Show to check out the very latest models that will be hitting our roads next year, including the new Land Rover Defender. There's nobody in the passenger seat, so we're going to get in. Friend of the show, Karun Chanduk, joins us for a team test to put the Audi RS5 through its paces and see how it compares to its BMW and Mercedes rivals in the premium performance saloon market. Whoa! It was tighter than I thought. And Jimmy DeVille goes sci-fi with some space-age F1 technology that looks set to transform how classic cars are preserved. I definitely am now living in the future. But first, Jason and I are taking a hop across the channel to La Belle France. Au revoir, Angleterre. And we're travelling in style, testing out the most powerful grand tourers currently on sale. <laughs> <laughs> GTs are designed to combine opulence and performance on long transcontinental journeys. <laughs> but before we go any further, let's introduce these two beauties. They are the Aston Martin DBS Superleggera and the Ferrari 812 Superfast. If anything can whisk you across continents in the blink of an eye and in supreme style, it's these two. They come from two of the world's most celebrated car makers, possess looks to die for, gorgeous interiors, and boast truly staggering performance figures. For example, both punch out in excess of 700 horsepower, and both will top out at a mouth-watering 211 miles per hour. So we want to find out if these cars really are the ultimate supercruisers, and of the pair, which is best. I will start with the Ferrari. I've got the Aston then. We've got three tests lined up, starting with road manners. Now, there is a lot to talk about with this car, but before I get into details like specification, luxury, ride, comfort, etc., I need to get the power figures off my chest because under that long bonnet in front of me is a 6.5 litre, normally aspirated V12 engine with 800 horsepower. Oh, yeah. And it sounds like this. <laughs> <laughs> Get in! It is the most powerful engine Ferrari has ever fitted to one of its full production models. It'll hit 62 miles an hour in 2.9 seconds and 125 miles an hour in under 8 seconds. It is truly mental and I am loving it so far. So, was I getting equally excited in the Aston? Now, like the 812, the Superleggera is the most powerful production car that Aston Martin have ever made. But can it compete with the Ferrari? Well, not quite. It's only got a 5.2 litre V12 up front. And although Aston has then strapped on two big turbochargers, the result is only 725 horsepower. So do I feel a bit shortchanged? No. So I think we've established that neither car skimps in the power department. But what do they like to spend time in on a long trip? The fit and the finish and the design in here is just exquisite. There is a lot of carbon fibre, leather and Alcantara, and it all matches beautifully. It makes me feel like I'm in a luxurious quality machine. The seat is good, it's comfortable. However, I have to slide it manually. What? No electric? You'd expect basic electrics like this on a car costing 40 grand, let alone 200 plus. 
So, would JP detect any penny pinching in the Aston? There's no denying, this is beautifully finished inside. You know, the leather work, the stitching is lovely. I could imagine being in here all day, actually, and I'd feel good at the other end. GTs are all about luxury, but even these quarter of a million pound cars have optional extras. The list price of the Aston is 225 grand and the Ferrari 263. But these particular cars cost more than that, a lot more. Are you sitting down? Right, so we're having an option off. <laughs> on, you've got to guess my options, okay, babe. Okay, cool. Amber, think that little carbon bonnet grill might be? 1,500 quid. Two grand. Oh, OK, yeah. It's a lot of money, isn't it? I know. This is called triaxial quilting on Ooh. the seat. I'm going for £5,000. £1,995. Pounds. Just £2,000? Pounds? Just the £2,000. Pounds. Well, I'd, I'd take that, sir. Right, so this roof in mm -hmm. carbon... Yeah. That's three grand's worth that. £3,000. But do you know that's that ribbed for pleasure there? 1500 quid. Two grand. So that's five grand's worth of kit just there. That's right, I've got 50 grand's worth of options. I've got two pages worth, babe. So I'm going to pick out black ceramic exhaust pipes. 600 quid. 960. Carbon fibre inner door handle. Just that piece? Yeah. And on the other side. 600 quid. <gasps> 2,400. What? <laughs> You're joking, yeah. man. Just that? Yeah. How much have you got in options on this, then? Well, this started life at 263,000. Right. This particular right. one, 350. Best by 90 grand's worth of options. Yeah. Shall we swap? Oh, can we? Yes, of course. Oh, I thought I was in that all day. Oh, did you? Oh, come here, you. <laughs> So, back on the roads of northern France, and time for my first impression of the Ferrari. <laughs> Man, what a car! Yes, it's a little bit harsher over some of the bumps than the Aston. You'd get out of that after doing 200 miles and feel fresher than you would in this. But you'd have much more fun in this. Meanwhile, I just wasn't warming to the Aston. <laughs> I have got a real disconnect with this car. The noise isn't penetrating my ears. The sensation through the wheels, through the seat, through the pedals is not instant enough. It's not penetrating my soul. There's a delay. It doesn't tell me when it's quite going to go, and then it goes. God, every car should have an engine like this. It's insane, isn't it? Please, can I have my Ferrari back? So, the Aston might be a touch more comfortable on a long drive, but the sheer brutality of the Ferrari makes it the more desirable road car for us, and therefore it wins test one. Join us later when we'll see how much cheese and wine we can fit in the boots of these Super GTs, and which one attracts the most attention when it comes to looks and engine noise. Now it's time to get a first look and first drive of a brand new model. Yes, it's the fifth gear team test. Today, the team tested the Audi RS5 Sportback. It's a practical performance car and competitor to the BMW M3 and Mercedes AMG C63. It's priced at nearly 70 grand. RS Audis in the past have been criticised for not being as exciting to drive as rivals. So, to help assess its sporty credentials, former F1 driver Karun Chandok has joined us for the team test. This is the Audi RS5 Sportback. It is powered by a 2.9 litre V6 twin turbo, 450 horsepower. What do you reckon? It's green. I love that Sonoma green. Sonoma green. <laughs> do you, I love do you it. Not, I, I like it. Are you it. joking do you? me? No, no, I'm not a fan. Really? I'm not a fan. In the end, it's just like a bit of mushy pea kind of colour, which is not really my favourite. I think the front looks mean. I think yeah. it's quite feisty. You know in the rearview mirror that that's coming at you and it's a bit aggressive, <laughs> yeah. you know? It's sort of suffering from civic type R syndrome. It's like pointless vents in places. That's not real. Yeah, and but it looks, looks cool. good. <laughs> Some pointless grill action going on, but it's it's tasteful. It is tasteful. They, they've nailed that. Look at that crease yeah, there, that lovely, where it goes it? into that crease yeah. there. Yeah. Oh, no, that's very cool. So then we looked inside. Jason and I were up front, and yep, all lovely Audi bits and bobs. I like the wheel here. I do like the centre thing. It's very Perth. functional, very Audi. That and you just know it's going it's to work. work. Yes, but in the back, it was a different story. It feels a bit darker. I would have <laughs> liked to have seen the sunroof come. Back yes. a bit more, just a bit more light. What are you like in the back room, Johnny? 
Legroom fine. Yeah. Right. Headroom a little tight. I've got tons of legroom. Yeah, that's really, that's really good, actually. So we did the Alpine route first, just to understand the car's manners. It's good, isn't it? It's really sure-footed and it's quick, and it's exactly what you would expect. Have I got a massive amount of steering feel? No. But you've got a Porsche collaborated 2.9 twin turbo V6. And when I lift off the gas, it has that lovely little... It's all very Audi, isn't it? It's point and shoot. It's a Quattro. It's yeah. everything. Everything we're talking about. It's quick, like an Audi is. Yeah. It's functional, like an Audi is. Yeah. Is it exciting? To find out, we took the RS5 onto the handling circuit. Boy, oh boy, the scales dropped from my eyes. Generally, Audis. You know, are very safe. They understeer too much. It was an Audi that had quite a loose rear end. Fan flipping tastic. That feels not very Audi-ish to me. That's yeah. a bit of oversteer. I'll tell you what, though, yeah. it's quick, isn't it? Oh, it's so, so quick. This was quite a neutral, almost slightly oversteery feel to it, and that's fun. Karen had a go, and he really liked it. It took him by surprise. Oh, you can play it, which you can't normally do that with Audis. We nearly had a crash. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what was that? That was an interior that, that, wheel trim. Tell you what, Karun, you are whoa. You are good for pelvic floor exercises. You are really good. Oh, that was tight than I thought. <laughs> oh, man. Did you enjoy that though? I really did. I genuinely think I've changed my mind. I think I might prefer this over the CCC3. Really? Really? Yeah. Just driving on, it just feels so together. Yeah. Luckily, we made it off the test track in one piece, and just before the heavens opened. Had that taste of the RS5 whetted our appetites, or was the Audi a bit of a washout? I am thrilled to announce that the RS5 Sportback has reignited some passion that I have now got for Audis. And as a consequence, I'm going to give this car a very strong eight out of ten. It was much more fun than I expected, so I'm going to give it an eight. It's exciting, it's fun, it's quick, and it feels dynamic. So I'm torn. I'm either going to give it an eight or a nine. Let's split the difference. The Audi gets an eight and a half. I'm really quite taken by it. I'm going to give this an 8.5. Pretend my tongue is a point. Which gives the Audi RS5 an extremely impressive team test score of 33 out of 40. After the break, Johnny will be looking into the future at the Frankfurt Motor Show, including the first ever unveiling of the new Land Rover Defender. <laughs> You can actually put the car in neutral and push and pull the car. That's how strong this is. And Vicky and I will find out which of our Super GTs can turn the most heads. Wow. I'm surprised at that. Welcome back. Johnny has hopped over to Frankfurt, where he's managed to get one of the hottest tickets in town to check out some of the cars UK buyers will be tempted with in 2020. Hello, and welcome to the largest motor show in the world. This is the place that car manufacturers unveil their newest models, and this year is no exception. Over 50 car manufacturers fill the 12 halls and over 200,000 square metres of space here, which is a far cry from the first show in 1897, where there were a grand total of eight cars on display. The overriding theme at this year's show is electric vehicles or EVs, like this one, the fully electric Honda E. It's a little five-door with proper Japanese features like fabric interior, frameless doors and no wing mirrors. Apparently, Honda says this increases the range of the car by some 3.8% because it reduces a lot of drag. The E will only manage 125 miles between recharges, but Honda sees this as a city car, so that's probably enough and you can open and start it using an app. That's it. There's so many screens in this car. Oh, look, it's an aquarium. The E is the beginning of a plan by Honda in Europe to have 100% of its range to be electric or hybrid by 2025. And the Honda E's price, around 27 grand. Next stop, an EV at the other end of the spectrum, the 115,000 pound Porsche Taycan. 
Porsche's highly anticipated first electric model. It's available at the moment only as a two motor, so four wheel drive car. There's a motor there, there's a motor there. The Turbo S, which is the flagship car, some 760 PS of power, 625 for the turbo. No, they don't have turbos because electric cars don't have turbos. It's just a kind of spec pecking order performance. Zero to 62 in 2.8 seconds is the Turbo S. This can do up to 281 miles on one charge. This will be able to rapid charge in something like 15 to 20 minutes, higher than any car in existence. From Porsche to a more mainstream German manufacturer, also going down the EV route. Now, you might remember a few years ago, Volkswagen was a little bit naughty when it came to diesel emissions. Thanks to that, 50 billion euros has gone into an all-new sub-brand called the ID range, and the ID range is completely electric. The first full production car in this ID range is launched today, and it's behind you, there, the ID3. It's basically an all-new electric Golf. They're going to phase out the e-Golf, and this is going to be it. Rear-wheel drive, rear-motored, a range of different power outputs. You'll be able to order this as a 45, a 58, or a 77 kilowatt hour battery pack. From 200 to 340 miles of range, you'll be able to fast charge it in 40 minutes, 80% charge. But it's all quite familiar. It's not that radical. It's very tasteful. Volkswagen have got 30,000 pre-orders of these. They reckon they can press the button and make 50,000 straight away. Prices for the ID3 start at £25,000, and it goes on sale in summer 2020. Now for a car that'll cost 120 times more than that, and guess what? It's an EV2, sort of. This is the Lamborghini Shan. Translated means flash of lightning or just a woman's name. The most important thing you want to know is that is Lamborghini's first ever production hybrid. Now, it has the 6.5 litre V12 out of the Aventador, but it is linked to a 48-volt electric motor, and that is powered not by batteries, but by supercapacitors. Lamborghini says that they're a third of the weight of a conventional battery pack, but they can give out that instant power that you want, the hit. The result is 820 horsepower, 217 miles an hour, 0 to 62 in 2.8 seconds. They're only going to make 63 of them at £3 million each. Finally, I headed to the big launch of the show. It attracted quite a crowd because it's been eight years since a concept was first shown here, and this car doesn't get replaced very often. In fact, it's only ever been replaced once, and that's just now, the new Land Rover Defender. The last version soldiered on for nearly 70 years, so the new one needs to be very good if the legend is to live on. Although it isn't retro, They've done a really fine job at judging the kind of defenderness, that silhouette, wide, wide arches, very square cab, with it being quite sort of friendly and approachable. Prices start at £45,000, and of course, being a defender, it must be practical. This car will weigh to 900 millimetres, so nearly a metre of water. Under here, it's all rubber. This one's got the optional winch, so you see this removable panel? There's a winch in there. You can actually put the car in neutral and push and pull the car. That's how strong this is. And although the Defender launches with just petrol and diesel engines, next year there will be a hybrid version. So if you don't think electrified cars are here to stay, think again. I've just shown you a snippet of what's here at the Frankfurt Show. My question to you is, and I don't know the answer to this, in 10 years' time, are we going to see any car here on display with a piston engine? From Frankfurt to France, where Vicky and I resume our GT battle between the Aston Martin DBS Superleggera and Ferrari 812 Superfast. We've come to the continent to get a feel for these cars on the open road. And so far, the Aston has felt a bit old-fashioned and uninvolving. I feel like I've, like, aged ten years by climbing into this. Compared to the sheer excitement and slickness of the Ferrari. So, it's 1-0 to Italy. Now we want to dig a bit deeper in a challenge that we're calling the 3S test. Space, style and sound. We'll start with space. If you want to buy a GT, in particular one that costs more than 200 grand, you should be able to go on a grand tour of a lifetime. And you should be able to pack more than just a toothbrush and a pair of knickers. So I wonder, how much can we get in these things? And as we're on a day trip to France, we're going to be typical Brits and stock up with the essentials. 
So we just got booze and cheese. Come along, boy, hurry up. I've got 320 litres of beautifully lined boot. It feels a shame to put it in. I know. Capacious. We should go and buy some more. I'll put the fromage in. Gosh, this is terrific. More cheese. <laughs> the cheese and wine fitted into the Ferrari's boot with room to spare. Now it's the turn of the Aston, which partly because of its four seats compared to the Ferrari's two, has 50 litres less space in the boot. I have to bend down more to get it in your car. Could this be a squeeze? Well, I mean, we have got a bit too much cheese, haven't we? <laughs> we really need all that. Should we leave the water out? I mean, the cars aren't going to catch fire, are they? So we don't need no, the water. No, don't need water. Oh, but I like the basket. Why? I need the basket. The basket can go in, in your footwell. Oh, sweet. Yeah, perfect. That's it. OK, cool. Allons-y. So, although the boots of both cars swallowed our booze cruise baggage, we had to compromise slightly with the Aston. So the Ferrari grabs a narrow victory in the first of our three mini-tests. But let's move on to more important matters, because in cars like these, you want to be seen. With that in mind, we headed down to the beach to see which of these drop-dead gorgeous cars would turn the most heads. With the cars parked side by side, we had a spot of lunch and let the French public cast their vote. A stare of three seconds or more at a particular car counts as a point. In the sort of 10, 15 minutes that we've had lunch, I've been doing a tally. So, would you like to know the scores on the doors? Mm -hmm. Okay, the amount of people who stopped and had a proper interest in the Ferrari, 13. Aston, 14. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, the Aston narrowly wins. And it would get my vote on looks alone. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd agree, actually, I'd agree. Absolutely, the more beautiful the two. Next, we wanted to see which engine would stir the most souls. So we asked some holidaymakers to stand next to the car they think makes the best sound when we rev the engines. Time to dust off my GCSE French. Premier, the Aston Martin, OK? Jason? <laughs> Manton on the Ferrari. <laughs> oh la la. Un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq, six pour the Aston. Wowza. So, Jason, two people and me. That's unbelievable. Well, I'm four. over here. I'm over and this look side. Look at all these people prefer the Aston. That's incredible. Vicky and I didn't agree, but we had to abide by the verdict. So what was it about the Aston sound that won them over? This one has the same sound, high roads per, per minute, and this has different sounds. I think it's your lift-off pop-pop. So this is more brutal with more power. Right, better wrap this up before a fight breaks out. I suppose that's quite specific to Motrace, isn't it? It's quite F1-y. Maybe it's not everyone's cup of tea. So, at the end of our three S tests, the Ferrari nudged it on storage space, even though it has two less seats, while the Aston just won on style. However, the Superleggera then stormed to victory when it came to sound. And that means it wins part two of our GT Challenge and levels the contest overall. Join us later for the decider when we get on the gas. After the break, Vicky goes in search of a more affordable second-hand alternative to those GTs that'll still get the pulse racing. It sounds good. And Jimmy DeVille sees how a touch of sci-fi technology is being used in high-end and mainstream motoring. That is pop on, isn't it? Yep. Still to come, the final part of our Grand Tour showdown between the Ferrari and Aston. But first... Vicky tries out some cheaper second-hand alternatives that still have the wow factor. If you're in the market for a super-fast coupe, but you can't get your significant other to sign off the budget for a brand-new Aston or Ferrari, then do not worry, because I have three cars here that offer a similar experience, but for a fraction of the price. Yes, you could point any of these at the south of France, set off and smile all the way there for less than 30 grand. So, what are they? The Mercedes CL500. The Maserati 3200 GT. And the Aston Martin DB7. 
I'll start, as ever, with the cheapest, which can be yours for a snip at 10k. The CL500 is based on the S-Class, heavily based. It borrows the chassis, the engine, most of its structure and interior. And when something leans that heavily on an S-Class, it's going to be good. Very good. This CL500 is actually the base model. It's only got a 5.5 litre V8 that's good for 5.5 seconds to 60. The only other engines offered were highly tuned AMG ones. This has pedigree. If you are a badge snob, then the three-pointed star does not have as much cachet as an Aston Martin or a Maserati, but history tells us that you will spend more time driving this car, while owners of the other two will spend more time in the garage. This is the newest of the three cars here today, so if you buy one, you'll be getting the most up-to-date tech albeit over a decade old. But how does it drive? This is a really good Grand Tourer. Driving the CL is a lovely experience, thanks to the expertise of the S-Class's research and development department. It is fast, it is comfortable, and it can whip along despite its weight, 1,885 kilograms, or the weight of 18 giant pandas. You can manually override the six-speed gearbox by using these tiny little mouse ears behind the steering wheel. The sheer size of the thing means it is not a great B-road blaster. It is much more at home as a Grand Tourer where it's just covering lots of long distances. Put your foot down, let the auto box kick down and you can see all those miles being eaten up under the Merc's really long bonnet. The Merc is good on the road, but what will it cost to keep it there? Well, parts are relatively expensive, as you'd expect, but compared to the Maserati and the Aston, you might be onto a winner. The crankshaft position sensor can fail, and that means the car won't start when it's cold, but it can be fixed for just over £200. So the Merc is solid, comfortable and pretty reliable. But if you want to get more badge for your buck and are prepared to spend 15 grand, look no further than the Maserati 3200 GT. Well, this is a little more lively. I drive a Maserati. Words you don't often hear, and therefore they sound a little bit exotic. The 3200 GT signalled Maserati's intention to start playing with the big boys again. It was fast, stylish and pretty. Three words you hadn't been able to use when describing a Maserati for a very long time. This car was designed by Giorgetto Gigiaro, the head of Ital Design. So you are sharing some ink DNA with the DeLorean, the Mark I Golf GTI and the Lotus Esprit. It is eye-catching and by the trickle-down effect, so will you be. There is not a straight line in here, and although you don't feel as cosseted as you do in the Mercedes, it is a really fun place to be. Under the bonnet is a 3.2-litre V8 that will see you over 170 miles an hour, and it sounds good. This is definitely more of a sports car than the Mercedes-Benz. You can just feel it everywhere. However, it is not the best sports car. The brakes are a bit soggy, the steering's a bit lifeless, the gearbox isn't the best. Everything about it just needs a bit of work. But what this car cannot be faulted for is its character. It is fizzing with character, and you can fall in love with that. This 3200 is from 2001, so it's not going to be a teenager for much longer. Therefore, you need to be vigilant when you're buying yours. A full service history would be ideal, because although this is initially inexpensive as a cheap thrill, a poorly serviced Maserati will come back and bite you. So, would you be better off spending a bit more cash on this? The Aston Martin DB7, which could be yours from around 30 grand. Aston's had been boxy for far too long, and then the DB7 came along and reinvented the brand. This is arguably Aston's most important model since the DB5. Ian Callum designed this DB7 and it went on to be the company's most produced car ever. 
but its DNA was originally meant for a completely different car. Jaguar had a F-type on the drawing board, but that got canned when Ford bought out Jaguar and Aston Martin. It resurfaced and was given to Aston Martin, and it became the DB7, and the rest, as they say, is history. This is, without a doubt, a really good-looking car, and I fell in love with its looks when it first came out. But for 30 grand, you could buy a brand new Golf GTI. So is the Aston worth it? Quite possibly, if you love a 3.2-litre, six-cylinder supercharged engine that'll do 0 to 60 in 6.7 seconds and on to 160 miles an hour. It is a very different experience to the sprightly Maserati. And when it comes to maintenance, you better have deep pockets. The supercharger that helps this XJS-derived engine is a weak point. If it's whining or there is a lack of power, you could be in for £6,000 worth of bills. If it is the intercooler for the supercharger that's leaking, that's a bit cheaper at just a grand. All three of these Grand Tourers have been built for the same purpose, and they each have different characteristics. So, after a day with them, which would I go for? As ever, each has its own appeal, but for me today, big is best. I will take the Mercedes-Benz. Now it's over to our engineering wizard and custom car builder, Jimmy DeVille. This time he's looking at a manufacturing process that was once regarded as pure science fiction, but is now becoming commonplace and changing the way classic cars are preserved. Ever since I was a young man and I realised that if you needed a part for a motor vehicle, nine times out of ten, you could manufacture it. I've been getting these hands dirty in machine shops all over the UK. But there's a revolution on the horizon which means these could be staying a lot cleaner. The revolution is 3D scanning and printing and it's helping to keep classic cars like this MG on the road by making the production of replacement car parts faster and more affordable. I've come to KW Special Projects in Vista to meet Kieran Salter and learn more about the technology involved. Yeah, this. This, this is the indicator. That way. That way. <laughs> 3D scanning is already allowing us to make virtual versions of our most cherished vehicles for use in the future. Well, that's why we're calling it digital archiving. Yeah. You're creating a digital library of parts that you can then use in the future for manufacturing. So, it's a bit like Jurassic Park for cars. The first part of the process is to take a digital scan of the car and it's straight out of a sci-fi movie. Right, come on then. This spaceship <laughs> on lasers. That? What is that? This is your 3D scanner. That's so, ridiculous. I'm going to pass it to you. Please don't drop it. What are we talking then, value? Uh, it's less than 100,000. <laughs> <laughs> OK, right. What do I, Sorry. Is it going to go boop, boop, boop? No, you're gonna, hopefully it's not going to hurt you. So. I press the trigger and scan. Lasers come out. Yeah. And then the car appears on the screen. That's it? That's it. All right, here we go. This laser scanner is a far cry from the calipers and slide rule I'm more used to. It fires out seven lasers in a cross pattern, which make 480,000 measurements every second to produce an accurate digital image down to 64 microns. More detail than a human hair. And don't worry, it's safe for the human eye. Look at that! It's like painting the car onto the screen. The seat is literally perfectly appearing. You can see earlier where your buttocks have been. Yep. Literally, that is the level of detail. If I was to place my hand on the steering wheel... Is that getting that? Yep. We now have your hand and arm archived as part of this MG. Look at that! <laughs> There you go, you can digitally remaster me. <laughs> Not only are the lasers getting an incredibly accurate image of each component, they're also recording the exact positioning of the parts in three dimensions. Look at that, the gear shifter, the dashboard, the seats, the floor of the car, it's all there. And once we've got that data, it's completely portable. So we can store it in the cloud, we can keep it forever, and we can use it for doing all sorts of other activities later on in the car's life. Once a part has been scanned, it can be replicated by the 3D printer. But this one is light years away from the sort of thing you might have at home. This whole machine works inside a heated chamber. So that's sort of a giant oven. That's an oven. 
That's a giant oven. So it's keeping that plastic kind of molten so it sort of all bonds together. Exactly right. The most important thing is to stop it cooling down too quickly, which keeps it stable. What is that in there? This is a prototype for a wheel for this car. Right, so this is where I'm still a little bit confused because, forgive me if I'm wrong, but nothing on that car, certainly not the wheels, are made of plastic. In this case, we're printing the prototype first to make sure that actually fits the car, and then we're going to use that prototype to make the tooling. Having done a 3D scan of the wheel in the same way that I did with the MG, an exact plastic replica can be printed. This is then used to make a mould from which a metal casting will be made. So ultimately, we're still making the wheel in a casting, the normal methods, but we're using this prototyping technology to help us shortcut that process. So in the old days, you make a buck for casting. So someone in a fabrication shop would have sculpted that piece out of wood and that would have been put into the sand, made the impression which would have been cast. Would have taken quite a long time, probably a few months to make that buck. How long does it take to print? 21 hours and 32 minutes. So what that's doing right now is massively reducing the time scale in which you can make a product for like this car here. Time and cost. Okay. So, a process that used to take several weeks can now be performed more accurately in less than a day. Our replica wheel should now be just about ready. Oh, come on. All I need to do now is remove the support framework or scaffolding as it's known. Oh, look at that. Come on, tuck in, Kieran. Okay, there we go. There it is. On wheel. So we've started with the car. We've scanned it with the laser gun. You've then taken that scan and turned it into a three-dimensional drawing on the computer. From that, you've created a perfect Definitely. copy of that wheel. Exactly. And my hands are still perfectly clean. <laughs> Should we try it? Oh, look. I mean, look at that. That is bob on, isn't it? Yep. So from that, you can take your casting. You can get an exact replica of this wheel. That means that this car is now safe for the rest of its life because it's archived. Seeing this, I definitely am now living in the future. As well as 3D printing, keeping classics like these on the roads is also paving the way of car design. Mainstream manufacturers like Ford can develop new models faster and are now using the technology to design external bodywork components, which will affect the design and cost of producing future models. I'm going to be honest. When I arrived here this morning, I was slightly dubious that the technology I found inside that building was going to signal the end for the slightly dirty manufacturing and engineering that I absolutely adore. But it hasn't. It's added another layer to the engineer's toolbox, and it's a layer that's set to explode into a very, very exciting world. After the break, Vicky and I wrap up our French road trip and test out the acceleration of the Ferrari 812 Superfast and Aston Martin DBS Superleggera. And decide which is the best Grand Tourer. Toi, deux, un, allez! Welcome back to France and the finale of our ultimate Grand Tourer Challenge between the Ferrari 812 Superfast and the Aston Martin DBS Superleggera. Designed to be the ultimate combination of luxury and performance for long distances, so far we've discovered the Ferrari is superior as a general driver because it's more exciting. Man, what a car! However, when it came to style and sound, the Aston fought back and was the pick of the locals and tourists. Wow! So that's one all. Now it's time to sample the performance of these Grand Tourers, because if you're shelling out well over 200 grand, you've got a right to expect plenty of get up and go. And equally, some serious stopping ability. So we're going to conduct a real world combined acceleration and braking test on this deserted straight road. From a standing start up to 50 miles an hour, or 80 kph if you prefer, and back to zero. The car that completes the test in the shortest distance wins. Ferrari goes first. I've got 800 horsepower. I'm 165 kilograms lighter than Jason. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Vicky sounding confident, but pride comes before a fall. This nasty English croissant I will use as a marker. I'm gonna start where that little lay-by just begins, somewhere just there, I reckon. Okay, into first gear. Let's pop the old launch on. Alan, Alan, Alan! Oh, it bogged itself down. Ha, ha, ha! 
Unbelievable. I am donning the croissant. So in spite of a slightly tardy start, Vicky stopped pretty much where I'd predicted. So Jason used le croissant. I'm going to use la banane. Oh, yeah. And I think he's got... Mm. Oh, you, I might as well just lob it back there. Let's see. So now on paper, the Ferrari should win because that's good for 0 to 60 in 2.9 seconds. And this is 3.4. Now, we've both got carbon brakes. OK, this is a bit heavier, but you never know. So we're going to give it a go. And maybe something else would work in my favour. Thanks to its twin turbos, which cram more fuel and air mixture into the engine, the Aston's got more torque or pulling power than the Ferrari. A whopping 900 Newton metres against 718. Trois, deux, un, allez! <laughs> How much slower is that? Incredible. It just takes his time to get there. Wow. Unbelievable, eh? And when you stop, did it hunker down nicely or no? no? It just feels big and heavy and laborious. And... Yeah. As the Aston had performed so dismally, I decided to have another go. Well, I have to say, the first run wasn't very good at all. I mean, you know, the traction control is struggling. It's always teetering to wheel spin. So it's actually... We've got loads of torque, which is not putting it on the ground. Trois, deux, un, allez! It just keeps wheel spinning. You can't stop the wheel spin. And the other thing is you can't feel the wheel spin. Too much torque. You just cannot put the power on the ground. And the other thing is you can't predict it and feel it because you're so dis disjointed. You're not part... I can't feel what's happening. Yeah. Because the way the boost goes... Wah! And then it starts to spin and then it winds the power back and it cuts the throttle. Can I have a go in yours again? OK, so it wasn't the most scientific test, but the Ferrari stopped several car lengths ahead of the Aston. <laughs> Man, I love this car! Sadly, our trip was over too soon, and as we said au revoir to France and headed back through the Channel Tunnel, we had time to reflect on these two super GTs. So, test number one, road manners. What do we think? I know. Hands down, actually, surprisingly, because I thought that the GT car would be... But that's too soft, too yeah. compliant, too disconnected. Too mushy, yeah, 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 yeah. But this is so much better. Oh, yeah. The second test, sound, styling and space. The French voted. They said the Aston. They loved it. I'm surprised at that. But maybe this is a bit too mechanical, a bit... Piercing. ...digital for them, perhaps. Whereas that is throaty. <laughs> But that is a beautiful looking car. Arguably yeah. a nicer looking car than this. Yeah, and last of all, performance, not to 80 to naught again. Light I mean, not day. scientific test, but this is night and day. Yeah. So, end of the day, Ferrari key, Aston key, which one are we going to choose? Ferrari. Yeah. Ferrari wins. <laughs>